Welcome to Corpse Club, the official podcast of DailyDead.com. I'm one of your co-hosts, Jonathan James, I'm joined today by Scott Drebbit and special guest, Stephanie Crawford. Um, today we're going to be celebrating three incredible actors, Peter Cushing, Vincent Price, and Christopher Lee. Um, you know, I will use any excuse I can get for us to dedicate an episode to them. And uh, I was talking to Derek, who's not on this episode. <laughs> and I was like, well, mm. what are we going to do for this week? And I was like, well, it's, you know, it's, it's Peter Cushing and Vincent Price and Christopher Lee's birthday. Uh, Peter Cushing was, was born on May 26th, 1913. Vincent Price and Christopher Lee both share a birthday on May 27th, although Vincent Price was born in 1911 and Christopher Lee in 1922. And we're covering it on, on social media. And uh, I was like, well, let's do a podcast on it. And I was, you know, obviously, Scott, I, I knew I wanted to talk to you about this. And I'm like, well, let's, mm -hmm. I get somebody we can talk about. Who can we get? And then Scott immediately said, hey, let's, let's get stuff. So um, anyway, I'm really excited to have you on here. And um, I know our listeners are going to be excited to hear us talk about, like I said, these three incredible actors. And we're going to um, talk about some of our favorite picks. It's going to be a little bit different because it's not necessarily, you know, for me anyway, it's not my five favorite. And the way I think about this when it comes to Corpse Club listeners is we have at least two different types of listeners. We have some people here who are listening and, you know, they've grown up on Vincent Price and Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. And so for those people, hopefully we're going to bring up some titles here that are going to be either deeper cuts that you haven't seen, or maybe some you haven't seen in a while. And, um, and maybe hearing this uh, makes you think, hey, I should put that back on. And then for other people, um, there are a lot of younger horror fans, and we do have you know, plenty of younger horror fans who listen to Corpse Club. And you may say, well, you know, I hear these names. I know that they're you know, considered these iconic, incredible horror actors, but I don't know where to start. And so, you know... Um, Stephanie and Scott and myself are going to have some picks and you could probably start with any one of these and, um, and you'll, uh, you'll find something to enjoy. So, um, anyway, I think we're going to start first with, um, we're going to do some picks back and forth with Vincent Price and, uh, or for Vincent Price and Stephanie, I want to have you kind of kick it off and talk to us about what's your first Vincent Price pick. What's a title that, that you want to talk about and uh, tell our listeners about. Well, for my first Vincent Price uh, choice, I chose Madhouse from 1974, which was a very busy year for Vincent Price. Um, in this one, he plays Dr. Death. Well, actually, he plays an actor who plays Dr. Death, who is a popular horror character. And he has a really wonderful skull makeup on during a uh, part of it. And he's throwing a Halloween party to show his friends and his co-workers the new Dr. Death movie and announce his engagement. And uh, through this party, we, we kind of learn about the intrigue and the social politics going on, the movie making. And Peter Cushing is there, which uh, he was an actor friend who became a screenwriter. But there's a low-level animosity running through every relationship in the film. And it uh, feels like kind of a mild comment on the horror world. And Vincent Price just seems like he's having such a wonderful time in it, though that's pretty common in his, in his career. But with Madhouse, it's such an unusual film, and it has um, just shades of so many touchstone movies he made uh, throughout the years. Um, yeah, I've, I, I just love revisiting it. And I, I yeah, <laughs> I just think it's one everyone should check out, whether they're um, a fan of uh, Vincent Price and Cushing's already or if they're looking to kind of get into that. This one's definitely uh, one that I was watching quite a bit. It came out from Kino and I hadn't I hadn't seen it in a while, and I just left it in my Blu-ray player. Um, you're definitely right. I think Vincent Price looks like he's having a lot of fun doing it. Uh, I love how meta it is, especially you know at the beginning where they're kind of you know making jokes, and they they kind of like are winking at the audience throughout about um, about the film industry and the horror industry. Um, I also do have to say I love Robert Corey in it. 
Um, you know, those who listen to us, mm. Scott, you know, I, I love Count Yorga. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> Preach you know, it. Yeah. So, I mean, the original <laughs> idea before, you know, some of these companies ended up, you know, moving away from horror or going under was that, you know, they were kind of training up Robert Corey to be the next, um, you know, Vincent Price and to be the next big horror star. And he didn't get to star in a lot. So I, I am thankful for what we did get him in. Yeah. And I guess that caused a little animosity between him and Price. Not between them so much, but because the studio was pushing that so much, it just created tension that didn't really need to be there. And you can kind of feel it in the film. Yeah, that's that's very true. I did hear the story about, I, I wish I knew, paraphrasing it, the, the, the legend anyway, is that that they filmed a scene together, something like that. Robert Quarry said to Vincent Price, um, I bet you know, I." it was a, a scene where he had to sing. And he said, I bet you know, you didn't know I could sing. And he said, well, I knew you couldn't act. And um, I believe that is the, the story as it's told, whether it was true or not. Um, I, I don't, I, I haven't looked at the source. I believe, honestly, it came from Robert Quarry. So um, anyway, it, uh, it just kind of adds to the legend of this movie. Yeah, this is one that uh, it might as well be a blind spot because, geez, I think I saw it like 20 years ago or something, and and I really can't remember it. So that one's going to the top of my uh, uh, to-do list um, for sure. But I can only imagine that price and is uh, is terrific in it because I don't know when he wasn't. Yeah, I think it's actually one of my favorite roles of his, and that's saying something. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, um, Scott, I'm going to turn it over to you. What was your first Vincent Price pick that you want to talk about? I'll go with Theater of Blood. I always toggle between this and the other one that I'll be talking about. And you know me, I'm your basic bitch. So, you know what the other one is probably going to be. But Theater of Blood, uh, Vincent Price plays Edward Lionheart, this second-rate Shakespearean actor in London who continually gets snubbed uh, by the critics. And he gets so upset that he fakes his own death and then kills off all of the critics who always put him down. Again, a touch of the meta, Um, you know, not directly, but it's a commentary. You can see it as a commentary on Price's relationship with movie critics. Many who thought he was very hammy and campy and, and over the top and, and lacked subtlety, which I don't think that's true at all. I think to say a person isn't subtle, um, that's something they don't have control over. He was in complete control of his instrument. And, and I think in this movie, um, the way the humor, the macabre humor, uh, soaks up the entire movie and it just makes it a wonderful, wonderful watch. Not only is it one of my favorite Vincent Price movies, I think it's, it's one of my favorite movies, period. For me, this is one that I haven't caught up on in a little bit. So I really need to rewatch it. Um, it's not the one I go to first. And I I mean, I, 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 I mean, I really don't have a Vincent Price movie that I don't like. You know, you know, I love the Monster Club. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> like, it's not that I don't like it. It's just that I haven't seen it in a while. Um, what I do remember is it, it definitely wasn't my favorite at the time, but I really need to rewatch it. I don't know who released it. I don't know if Kino did put this one out. or. I what. have the Twilight Time release. That's what it was. I think with Twilight Time, it's just... Or rest that, in peace. This is true. Uh, but with Twilight Time, they, they're the quantities were so limited or maybe I heard about it late. And by that time I couldn't get it. So I think that's what the issue was with that one. Cause I got the scream and scream again from twilight time. I have the old school MGM uh, DVD, the midnight movies. I had so many of those. Oh, I love those. I still have a few kicking around. (laughs) And the thing, Oh, you go ahead. Sorry. (laughs) No, just going back, Theater of Blood, um, it ranks really highly up there to just seeing Vincent Price uh, play such a bitter character. And they really go for it with the complex murder set pieces. Um, so I think once you do revisit it, I, I uh, it's just such it's so mean, but in such a playful way. 
I think that's probably why when I was, you know, because, you know, and I, I guess we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. I mean, I grew up on, you know, on Vincent Price and, you know, Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee more than I did did slashers. So like for me, like this is, you know, it, it's definitely comfort food. Watch it all the time, you know, during Halloween with the family. So I can imagine when I was younger that this is a movie that my mother wouldn't have liked as much. Therefore, I didn't see it as much. Therefore, my brain didn't go to it right away. Um but, uh, but yeah, anyway, I, I got to rewatch this one a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, you'll love it. Yeah. I know it. So, uh, Stephanie, I'll kick it back to you. What's your second Vincent Price pick? Well, how about we go super lighthearted with Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine? <laughs> oh, that title. It's just so good. And even better, the Supremes sing the theme song. And most of the lyrics are repeating Dr. Goldfoot in the bikini machine. So it's a great mm -hmm. earworm. Mm -hmm. um, but the plot, it's pretty much what the word madcap was invented for. Uh, Price plays a mad scientist who is so brilliant. He created um, completely lifelike robots. They're all beautiful women in bikinis, of course. And he uses them to rob uh, rich men. So he created this amazing technology, the likes of which the world has never seen before. And it's like to rob rich, horny guys. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's hard to hold it against him um, <laughs> in this movie. Um, he's very grumpy. He yells a lot, um, but he has a little whimsy to him, uh, like when the, the bikini robots break out into little dance numbers. He kind of gets into it for a few seconds and dances with them until he realizes what he's doing and has to yell to everyone again. Um, but it's just it's ridiculous fun. It's especially great for people who are also fans of the American International Beach movies. It stars Frankie Avalon. And it has uh, Annette Funicello has a cameo where she's in stocks, which is incredible. And even Eric Von Zipper from those movies mm. is in it. So I feel like if you're not familiar with like the beach blanket bingo movies um, where and Vincent Price pops up in some of those sometimes uh, a few of those references will go over your head. But overall, it's just such a goofy, joyful, colorful film. Yeah, I think I, I I haven't seen this entire film. I've I've just seen um, bits and pieces of it. But from what I saw, you know, I, Austin Powers owes quite a bit, I think, to the sensibility of this, even more so than um, James Bond. But what I did notice was that Norman Torog um, directed it. Uh, who was an animator turned director and uh, he, he did a lot of the best Jerry Lewis movies. And, and from what I could tell from the footage I saw it, like you said, it's very lively and playful and, uh, and just a lot of fun and great to see price doing something like this. Yeah. He even has kicky little gold shoes himself. Oh, he's <laughs> gold foot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I remember those beach party movies. I haven't seen them in ages, but it goes back because a lot of these things for me are, are go, go back to remember when, because my, my mother did love the beach party movies. The, the, I was like beach blanket bingo, um, bikini beach. And, um, and so I used to watch those all the time. We had them on VHS and, and those, you know, and, and I, I don't know if you re you remember, uh, if either one of you did, um, but when you'd record movies and you re record them off, the TV had like SP, what was it? Yeah. SP, LP, and SLP, whatever was the long one, <laughs> the six hour one. So it would just Super like- Super long play. There yeah, you go. SLP. So SLP. So we would have like, you know, three, maybe three and a half movies there, depending on when the uh, the tape cut out. So, you know, and so there were beach, beach blanket tapes. And so I can remember watching some of these and um, and Dr. Goldfoot as well. So, and this is also a Kino release. Kino really loves these guys. I've noticed. Yeah, they, they've done a real good job. I mean, it's it's so nice that we don't just have, you know, 
one company doing this, but if it's not coming from Kino, it's coming from Scream Factory. If it's not Scream Factory, it's Severin or, or Vinegar. And, and um, so it's nice that we're getting all of these um, in the best possible or given, given the best possible treatment. I, I like uh, paying attention to Kino because they're very eclectic. And so you really have to keep your eyes peeled because there aren't movies coming from them that you would necessarily expect. Um, they're kind of all over the map, but they're always worthwhile. Yeah. Agreed. The other day I picked up, I think I mentioned this on, on one of the other podcasts. I picked up Hercules in the haunted world and I had never seen it. And okay. um, that was great. And that was from Kino and that had, had Christopher Lee in it. And that, that was a good watch. That was a Mario Bava, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was great. Yeah, yeah. And so is the sequel to this, Dr. Goldfoot and the Girl Bombs. <laughs> That's right. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting because um, his Italian sensibilities clash with the English sense of humor in it. So it's a little strange, but it's def definitely worth checking out sometime. Okay. See, I got to pick All it right. up. Yeah. That's going on the list. Yeah. Okay. Well, Scott, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Uh, I mean, for me, it can only be the abominable Dr. Fibes. Um, this was my gateway um, for Vincent Price. This is the one uh, when I was a kid growing up, this is the one that would show up on, on TV. And um, I became really attached to his persona and, and his, um, again, that, that sense of humor, that dark winking sense of humor um, that lets you know that it's all a show, uh, but you, you're supremely entertained. Um, everyone knows the story of Dr. Fibes. Of course, the former, um, he was a surgeon and uh, he allegedly died and then his wife uh died her operation was bungled by these doctors so he fakes his death and then he comes back and uh, gets revenge kind of very similar to theater of blood um and he uses the biblical plagues as his uh as his uh comebacks towards the surgeons who uh botched his wife's um surgery um again it's that creative death thing that was started around this time um, that really, I think, separated Price from the other two gentlemen that we're going to be talking about is that his were very um, high concept, uh, which is what I really loved about them. And they're so, they know exactly what they are, the Fibes movies and Theater of Blood, and Price knows exactly what he's doing and gives the exact performances that those movies require. Um, and I just think he was really unique in that way. And, um, you know, so Abominable Dr. Fibes and also the sequel, I think, is just as good. So, yeah, that is my other pick. I mean, this is the this is the original saw, <laughs> you know, this is this kind of yeah. really kicked that off. This was you know, this movie was huge. I, I don't think, you know, maybe not everybody realizes how big this was for Vincent Price. Like this brought him back into the um, into the into the mainstay. Um, you know, I guess this kind of propelled him to like pop culture icon, at least, you know, for the 70s and 80s. And that continued into today. Um, you know, some of the other actors, you know, didn't continue on into, into those decades. And, um, but, th but this really propelled him and which has kind of kept him alive to this day. Um, this is one that I, that I watch quite a bit. This is one of, uh, my wife, Christy is one of her favorite movies. It's on the, yeah, uh, for sure. Um, she's a huge Vincent Price fan and she loves the second one as well. Um, but this is on the Vincent Price collection, Blu-ray. Um, though that first edition now is out of print. So, um, I'm sure there are, I don't know what the, I don't know how the UK version, I don't know. don't remember how they handled it. I, I have, I have that. You have it. Did uh, Arrow, from put, Arrow. Did they put the Fibes yeah. movies together? 
Uh, yes, I think they did a limited edition set, um, but I was too late for that. But they do have them both out. Cool. Yeah, I did. I did remember that. And then they split them across the Vincent Price collections at Scream Factory. So I know you get like I think volume one is Abominable, and then the sequel is uh, is in volume two. I mean that makes sense, right? From a business standpoint, anyway. Well, sneaky, yeah. but yeah, I guess you're. <laughs> <laughs> I'm buying all the Vincent Price collections, so I mean they, they, they had me at Vincent Price collection volume X. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is one of my favorites, too. I, I'm wild about it. So unique. Um, I guess I'd call it psychedelic macabre. And you can. You All right. can <laughs> I can. You don't have to call it that. I'll call it. that. No, I like it. I like it. OK, you can call it that then. All right. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, no, it's just so audaciously original. It has a wonderful sense of fun, but it's so gruesome, too. And it just balances them all wonderfully. It, they're so fun. Yeah, it's it, for the exact same precise reason, Jonathan, you're going to love Theater of Blood mm -hmm. because it's very much in tune with this. I would say what Fibes has over theater of blood and it's really the only thing is is that the set design in in the fives movies is gorgeous it's this beautiful art deco you know this and there's these all these different you know anachronistic uh touches in it that uh is just another big p uh, part of why it's so great you know yeah there's so many things about it too that like you know, these days, like, especially if it was going to be a studio movie, they'd be like, no, we can't have those like robots. We can't have that musical number. We can't have that, <laughs> uh, that orchestra. So, um, yeah, this is, this is a good one. Um, so we're going to, we're going to move along. We got, we have, uh, we have, uh, Peter Cushing, we got Christopher Lee to cover. Before we do that, I was going to uh, jump in with my pick to close things out. And originally I was going to be like, well, it's going to be House on Haunted Hill because of course it is. I talk about it all the time. Um, but actually I want to go with House of Wax. Um, oh, I thought you were going to do the Monster Club. <laughs> you know what? Or, or yeah, or the Monster Club, right? But I talk about those two too much. So you know, if people have been listening, then hopefully they checked both out. But I want to talk about House of Wax because I don't know. I feel like... You know, when, when looking at our picks, I think this one's a, a well-rounded one. And this one also is it kind of takes us further back. You know, we're in we're in 1953 with this. And so this was I, it was either this or House on Haunted Hill. Honestly, I don't remember. But this would show all the time on, on TV. And but I think it's kind of gotten lost. I've noticed that as, you know, certain movies tend to get lost depending on what studio they move to or how they get released. And Warner Archive actually did release a did, did re-release this and, and they do have it on Blu-ray, but I don't think there's as much buzz around it. And maybe it's just because it's an older film as well. Um, but this remains one of my favorite Vincent Price movies. Um, I think it's, you know, in, in some of the movies, he's definitively um, the bad guy, or at least we know what arc he's headed or, or where he's headed in his arc that, um, that he's headed uh, in, down a bad path. But I think with this one is that he's like, I feel so bad for him. He plays a sympathetic character. And then even though you see him as this monster, which, which, you know, definitely kind of resembles more of like this classical, like, you know, Phantom of the Opera type monster. Um, you know, you just, I, I, anyway, I feel, feel bad for the guy, you know, he had this, um, you know, he, he, he was a, a gifted artist. Uh, he just wanted to continue doing his art and money got in the way and almost got him killed and um, and turned him into to the monster he became. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things to love about this. I, I'm a sucker for a good detective story. And, um, you know, I could could take or, or leave the 3D these days. But back in the day, I mean, it was it was the first uh, 3D movie in color. So there was that spectacle that, um, you know, and buzz that surrounded it at the time. But yeah, for me, this is just a, a great movie. I could rewatch this anytime. I am so glad that you actually chose this as your pick because this this was the film that was started the second act of his career. Um, you know, the one that really uh, solidified who he was. And, and this is the one that started it off. Plus, you also get Chuck Bronson. I mean, how how do you go wrong? He was so innocent then. He was. 
I, I, I kind of like wax horror movies in general. I, I was thinking about all of them and, um, I think they're all kind of wonderful. <laughs> Mm. It's just, there's something fun about that uh, conceit, I think. But I do think House of Wax is the best of the best. You know, it 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 is just. I mean, and in some cases, it's creepy. And and even if it's not creepy to you as an adult, you know, I think you know, kids are always like, "Is that a real person? Are they frozen?" So I think there's that there's that like unknown aspect of it as a kid um, when you go to a real wax museum. I think they were able to kind of capture that in this movie and in others as well. Um, I think that's why it works so well. You know, I think the most, for me, the most delightful thing about this movie is that, you know, Andre uh, Toth, the director, uh, was making a 3D movie and he only had one eye. I just love that. That's kind of beautiful. It It is. is. Yeah. It really is. Because it's it's shot fantastically, and I can only imagine going back to 1953 and wearing the 3D glasses and watching this movie. That would be just the biggest kick. Yeah, this, and, and I wish I was around for the house on Haunted Hill, like them bringing the skeleton through the audience. Oh, I would oh, have killed yeah, to see those right? William Castle gimmicks. Yeah. I heard yeah, no somebody kidding. did it. I heard somebody did it recently at a screening. I don't know who it was. I'd say sometime within the last five years, somebody ended up at doing it at a screening. I was like, how did I not know? <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, these were some great picks. Um, and the, you know, for anybody listening, like I said, if you haven't really caught up on Vincent Price, you can start with any of these and have a good time. And um, if you watch a lot of Vincent Price movies, hopefully um, we suggested one that you can check out. Maybe you haven't seen or haven't seen in a while. And uh, with that, I want to move on to Peter Cushing. Um, you know, we're going to do the same kind of thing. We're going to talk back and forth about some of our picks, why these movies mean so much to us, why Peter Cushing means so much to us. And, uh, this time, Scott, I'll have you kick us off. What's your first pick? Peter Cushing. Um, again, he was a guy that as a kid, uh, when we would go to the Saturday matinees, he would be sometimes in movies as the you know, elderly, um, the elderly professor, this or that. But it wasn't until I saw him in horror movies that I, I really realized where his uh, popularity um, was. But for the first movie I chose, I wanted to uh, highlight a cushion film that's different than what we normally see, and that's uh, Corruption, which is a thriller about a surgeon. There seems to be a pattern here. There, everyone's a surgeon tonight. He's, um, he's a surgeon who has a fiancé. Um, uh, she gets in an accident, and her face is disfigured, and he finds that if he takes um, fresh flesh – say that five times fast, he can graft it on her skin and it will stay, but it only lasts for a certain period of time. So after he's killed, you know, one woman to replace the flesh, she needs to kill another, another, et cetera, et cetera. It's, um, it's a really different role for Cushing. And that's why I wanted to, uh, bring it up. It's a really solid movie. And, um, you know, he carries it. The entire movie is on his shoulders and he gives a really, really strong performance. This is one of those that I haven't seen in a little bit. I, I've definitely watched it before. And I even think, um, cause I think Grindhouse, uh, releasing ended up putting this out. And so I did see it, um, when that one came out as well. But, you know, I guess as I'm talking through this, like I, I, I like them in certain roles that feel comfortable. <laughs> and this one is Peter Cushing. Definitely. Um, I guess in, in a movie that's not only kind of, it feels like it's a little ahead of its time. It's not usually what we're used to seeing from him. And it does definitely make you a little uncomfortable. Um, this is, this is a good pick and I wasn't expecting this, Scott. You're welcome. What about you, Steph? I'm well, for me, I, I went the other direction a little bit because mine is a little bit of a cheat because it technically stars Christopher Lee. Oh. There. 
but I love the film so much and I love the chemistry in it that I kind of snuck it in. But we're talking about all of them. I think it'll work. Of course. Anyway. There's no cheating here. <laughs> it's a counts. universe. It's a shared universe. It go. really is. Well, yeah. Um, but Horror Express. Nice. Um, I'm a sucker for a movie set on a train. I'm an even bigger one if it's a horror film. And I think this is the finest. Uh, it's set on the Trans-Siberian Express. And it's so gorgeous. I just want to live on this train, even though everybody's getting killed. That's fine. You know, everything costs. Why not? Um, but uh, Christopher Lee, he's an anthropologist and he's carting around um, a frozen furry creature of unknown origin. And Cushing is there as um, they're technically rivals, but they do also come across as longtime friends. And one thing leads to another. And of course, the creature escapes. And this one gets compared to the thing a lot because it, it um, quote unquote infects people, takes control. And it's kind of uh, they're just running around this train. It's it's witty. <laughs> um, it, it's full of very, very colorful characters. Telly Savala shows up and he steals the show for a while. Mm. Um, it just it kind of has everything I love in a horror film. Um, and yeah, Cushing in it, he's wonderful. He really does kind of let Lee lead the stage. I one thing I love about Cushing is he's so incredibly talented. He can take command so easily, but he, he really had no ego uh, letting other people when it came to letting other people shine. And that really comes through in this one. Um, it really a lot of times comes off as like two friends trying to solve a mystery together. And it's just so fun. There there wasn't any way I, I couldn't pick Horror Express. Oh, and it was I have the out of print Severin Blu-ray, but Arrow did a really lovely edition of it. Yeah, you know, see, I've only still seen this movie in the umpteenth uh, crappy uh, public domain yeah. uh, no, versions it, it's that are out to there. Upgrade everybody. Oh, I know. I I need to do it. Yeah, Shame I haven't upgraded me. either. I have the old old DVDs where it was on with like ten other movies. <laughs> yeah, that's I that's what I have too. Which is is crazy because I can only imagine that it's a beautiful um, looking movie. But like you said, it's just, a, it's a lot of fun out of, um, I think out of all the movies that we're discussing, it's, it's, um, it feels like one of the faster paced ones. Not that we've picked any like slow, slow moving ones, but um, this one's it's on a got train. A, so it's yeah. Faster. Well, it's, it's, it's on a train, so it's faster, but it does have a little, it has, does have a lot of really, um, great pop and energy to it yeah i mean i would i would say that out of probably all the movies we've talked about maybe some of the ones we will that this probably if i had to tell our listeners and they haven't seen any of these movies maybe start with this one <laughs> i think this is a, a good one to kind of get you into it and get you excited for um you know what these actors are capable of and there are so many um movies that uh peter cushing and, and christopher lee did together they had such a great chemistry and such a friendship you know on screen and off screen and um, it's just such a joy that we got to see them in so many movies um but yeah with that let's uh let's move back to you scott what um what's your second peter cushing pick okay well the first one like i said i wanted to highlight one that maybe um, a lot, some people weren't familiar with, uh, just to give them a little bit of the range that he had. Now, my second pick is, uh, one that has to be on any list because it was the start of hammers domination. And that's the curse of, uh, Frankenstein and Peter Cushing's first turn as Frankenstein. And, uh, he would play it many, many times. Uh, and of course, back to our shared universe, there he is with his very good friend, Christopher Lee, as the creature. Um, this is a movie for me that's lost none of its power uh, over the years. It's just gorgeous looking. The performances are 
terrific. Lee makes a fantastic, unique creature. And Cushing uh, starts one of his iconic roles. So, um, I mean, for me, there was just no question that this this had to be on a list if we were going to be uh, celebrating Peter Cushing. Yeah, it's, um, it, you know, there's just this definitely like for me, I guess as I was younger, Dracula pulled me into Hammer. But I find myself, you know, going more and more to these Frankenstein movies. There's just, you, you know, when you think about your your movie monsters, you do think about your, um, you know, your mummies and, you know, and Dracula. And you think of Frankenstein's monster. But Frankenstein is the villain and the character that we watch throughout an entire series of movies. Um, it's just incredible. And there are so many aside from, you know, Curse, we have Revenge, um, Evil Frankenstein. I'm not going to say these in order. Uh, Frankenstein and the Monster of Hell. Uh, Frankenstein Created Woman. Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed. Um, those are all the ones with, uh, with Peter Cushing in them. And they're all a joy. And we're all getting them on Blu-ray these days. Um, if you're not getting the UK versions or if you don't have those already, um, Scream Factory is releasing or has released um, a bunch of them already. I think they just released uh, Curse. Right. Uh, how about you, Steph? Do you, what do you think of this one? Um, this See, with the Hammer Frankenstein films, I've seen them all once. And I did something I don't normally do, and this is why I marathon them very close together, and it kind of melded into one giant super film <laughs> in my memory. That, that sounds awesome, actually. It, it <laughs> was, but each film deserves its due, so I, I do need to revisit them. Yeah, definitely worth a rewatch. One of the ones I haven't seen in a while was Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell, and I'm very excited we're getting that. I don't think I dreamt it. I could have had a Blu-ray dream, but I'm pretty sure the Screen <laughs> Factory is releasing it because it was a Paramount title. Sometimes I have, we've been doing this for so long, sometimes I do dream news and then I wake up like, that didn't happen. That wasn't announced. <laughs> um, but in this case, I do believe it. it's a it's a real story and I will have a Blu-ray of Frankenstein and the Monster of Hell sometime this year. Um, <laughs> and uh, Possibly, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty positive. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie, we'll kick it back to you. What's your second pick? My second pick is a Hammer film, and it's Twins of Evil. Um, and this one's interesting because it's not my favorite. I do enjoy it. There's a lot of great things about it, but it's Cushing's performance in it. He is the... Um, uncle to these beautiful twins and they end up moving in with him uh, and he's going to be their father figure but he also happens to be a puritanical witch finder and um, these uh, twins especially one of them they start getting seduced into the vampiric side um, and what I think is interesting um with uh, the Witchfinder General, with Vincent Price, he is so mean in that. And you can tell he doesn't really believe what he's doing. <laughs> he, doesn't be he doesn't believe in it. He just believes in sadism. Mm. And in this one, uh, Cushing's character, uh, he does seem to truly believe, have a deep biblical belief in what he's doing is right. And seeing it, how it affects him when it starts entering his own home and he can't really look, just call someone he doesn't know a witch. But the, it's these young girls living in his house and he has to um, maybe try to find a solution rather than automatically burning people. Uh, I think it's an interesting dichotomy. Um, and I, I love Cushing in it. He's mean, but not one note mean. This is a yeah. This is this is a, a favorite of mine. Um, it was one of the Hammer movies I discovered later in life. It was a uh, you know one of those drive-in super monster ramas, and I got to see it um, on the big screen. And I'm like, how did how did I miss this one? And then after that, there was the oh, Synapse put it on Blu-ray, and so I have the Synapse Blu-ray. <laughs> And oh, it's wonderful, especially yeah. the feature-length documentary on it. Yeah, 
it's um it's it's definitely worth the pickup. And now I think it's well, I think it's on Shutter as well. But um but yeah, I had the Synapse Blu-ray and you know, this is this is another one of those comfort food ones. I can watch this all the time. I can watch a lot of Hammer movies, but um, you know, the Karnstein trilogy is when Hammer decided, you know, along with um, you know, Vampire Circus and um you know, and a couple other movies, they wanted to, you know, move things in a different direction. They wanted to go sexier. They wanted to go bloodier. And we see that in these, uh, hammer movies in the seventies. And, and, and there's a lot to like about this. Um, like I said, like, like you had said, Steph, Peter Cushing's great. Um, and, um, and he's not one note. And, uh, you know, I, I, I usually like seeing him as, as the good guy, but I also like seeing that flip. Um, and so this is, this is a great movie for that. Yeah, this is another one for me. Um, I still have not seen this. Uh, I've seen stills of it for 25 years, but I have not seen uh, the actual film. So, again, that's like the third one that uh, tonight that are going to the top of my list to uh, to do to watch or rewatch. I'm excited right, for we're to see being that influential. one. <laughs> yeah. <I like> that. <laughs> Who else am I going to talk to? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to uh, close things out with uh, Tales from the Crypt, 1972's nice. Tales from the Crypt, the anthology movie. Um, you know, and like I said, it's interesting because, you know, like I said, some of our listeners, I know you've seen this over and over again, but there are also plenty of people who are just getting into horror or they may love horror of, you know, the 80s and 90s and today, but, you know, they, they don't go as far back. And so um, maybe you've seen Tales from the Crypt, the TV show, but you haven't seen the movie. I would highly recommend it. Um, there are a lot of great segments. Um, but, you know, I really think that um, that the best one or my favorite one is, is Poetic Justice where you have Peter Cushing starring as uh, Arthur Grimsdyke. This, yeah. um, exactly. He, <laughs> he portrays this character with that, that just, just tugs at your heartstrings. It is, I, it is still a difficult segment for me to watch. It's uncomfortable. It's, it, it, it's, I mean, I, I don't know if it's it, their mean spirited. I don't know if it's mean spirited by itself, but like, it's not like I love this movie and I love the performance, but it makes me sad. <laughs> um, and and for, for that alone, it's it's worth just seeing. Uh, like I said, it's seeing this anthology film. But um, this also really, you know, th th there are others, but I think this really also propelled Amicus. Um, we're going to do an Amicus episode. So we'll, we'll be talking more about all the anthology films that you can check out and what we think about them. But um you know, I could not mention this one. And this is on a Blu-ray double feature with Vault of Horror from Scream Factory. Now that's value for your money right there, kids. Okay. So with, uh, with that, we're going to move on to Christopher Lee. Last but not least. Stephanie, I will have you start things off with your pick. Can I just say for the record, this was an incredibly hard assignment. <laughs> narrowing these down um it's I very wanna, sophie's choice isn't it it is but it's like sophie's choice if she had like 20 kids that's right and 18 of them had to go <laughs> but um for my christopher lee it's even um, sadder <laughs> exactly <laughs> and that's the position you put <laughs> me into um, this might be a bit of an unusual choice, but it was my first Hammer film. Uh, I picked it up. For, I was a teenager. I picked it up on VHS. DVD was out, but that's how I happened to f uh, find it. And it is Dracula AD 1972. And uh, this definitely has its fans, but um, it's... I've heard a lot of people think it's kind of trashy. It's um, I think they preferred maybe the Dracula character not in modern times at the time. Um, but for me, I t I, I think it, it, it's a fresh take. It's it's just goofy enough, but I think it's kind of exciting. You could tell there's a lot of experimentation going on. I feel like it. Um, Christopher Lee's Dracula didn't really need 
any reviving, but this still, I feel like, maybe reinvigorated him a little bit. And it's just, it feels like very much a party film. And Carolyn Monroe is in it, which is an automatic watch, in my opinion. Um, so it, I don't know, is this an un- unusual of all the wonderful films he's been in to Dracula 80, 1972. Well, listen, I'm just going to get out of Jonathan's way because <laughs> he's already warming up the microphone. Oh, gosh. This, this is not <laughs> this is not my favorite um, of the Christopher Lee Dracula movies, but it's fine. And I'll get out of the way now. And <laughs> here comes Jonathan. You could hear me grinning ear from ear, <laughs> from ear to ear, Scott. So, you know, Steph, when you sent this over, I thought, I don't know how I'm going to tell Scott this, but Scott, you're out of the Corpse Club. <laughs> we got a replacement because you're always hating on Dracula AD 1972. And now oh, I got somebody. Hating is strong. Hating you, is strong. You're all, okay, you're always not loving <laughs> Dracula AD 1972. And now I have somebody that realizes that the genius that this movie is. Um. <laughs> well, that's fair enough. It's been a good run. And uh, thank you, everybody. This was it. This was the surprise. The surprise. Uh, you're off the island. But no, uh, <laughs> I'm so glad to see you pick this because if you didn't pick it, I was going to. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a fun one. This uh, I mean, I love this for for many reasons. Kind of like what you said. I understand that if you grew up watching Hammer, if I was watching my favorite movie series and all of a sudden they moved it to modern day, I'd be like, what the hell is this? None of the rules make sense anymore. It's a complete reboot. So I, I get people that, that aren't on board. Um, but I think it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a snappy movie. It uh, has a killer soundtrack, as I've said before. And, yeah, I definitely could have. I mean, we did get more movies. You know, we did get additional um, Satanic Rites of Dracula that was modern day set. But it had none of the magic that this movie did. Mm. So I kind of wish we had more sequels that were as lively as this. Yes, and even has a hint of slasher movie to me with just the group of young hippies that feel like they'll live forever, but they'll soon find out that's not the case. And I love how none of them, just all of them think that that was a joke. And, they, you know, they start disappearing. It's like, oh, no big deal. Like, you know, she just <laughs> went to visit her parents and like, oh, that makes sense. The most of them anyway. Um, but yeah, this Steph, one's... Do you, Steph, do you think I should rewatch this? And give it another chance. Do you deserve to rewatch this? <laughs> well, I'm, yes, I'm not. Scott. I say an emphatic yes. Okay. Well, I'm not going to ask Jonathan because he's already kicked me out of the club. So you're never kicked out of the club. It's that's a why f- I thought I would check with you if I should rewatch. Uh, it. That's that's a, that was a good move. But yeah, you're not, it's it's a it's club for life. It's like the mafia, Scott. Even if you try to leave. We'll pull you back in. Oh, Jesus. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> You'll see. Yeah, I, well, I told you randomly, I will. One day I will call you on the phone and it'll just be, you'll be like, hello. And I'll be like, welcome to Corpse Club, the official podcast of DailyDead.com. <laughs> and we'll just start the episode. <laughs> you'll be in it whether you like it or not. <laughs> okay. Um so I will uh, move it back to you, Scott. What's your pick? Christopher Lee. What a career, eh? Um, my God, so well known as the villain, but he was so civil, civilized and, and uh, dashing um, and sinister. But again, uh, much like the other two gentlemen we were talking about, very much in control of his uh, persona. You know, he knew exactly who he was playing in each movie. And he did get opportunities to get away from the Dracula persona. For instance, when he made uh, The Devil Rides Out, in which he plays an aristocrat who's also a cult smasher. Uh, this was Christopher Lee as, uh, even hard to say as action hero as within all capital letters. Um, this was a movie that should have been the start 
of a series, I think, with Christopher Lee as an occult uh, hunter and and authority. Um, it's it's terrific. It's it's one that I've I only recently saw a couple of years ago and was completely blown away by how great it was. And, and if people haven't seen it, uh, I beg you, I, I think um, Scream put out a blue. Yeah, they just put out a Blu-ray. Right. Um, pick it up. It's if you want to see another facet of Christopher Lee, um, see him as. Um, hero, capital letters. It's it's quite a good look on him. For me, this is one of those movies where I had seen it when I was younger and then I was trying to track down a copy so I could watch it again, but it was Anchor Bay. I think Anchor Bay had an out-of-print DVD and it was like hundreds of dollars. <laughs> so thankfully, wow. you know, and, and, and I don't know why I don't have, I'm not going to, go off topic for too long. I promise. I don't know why I don't have a region free player. It's like I can solve my own problems, (laughs) but instead I waited till I could find a a cheaper copy of it. And uh, and now I have that. Plus I have the, um, I guess the, one of the, one of the UK Blu-ray copies was, and ended up being region free so I could play it or region one and zero. I don't remember whatever happened. <laughs> it worked. My brother got me uh, a UK copy. He's like, it'll play on your player. I'm like, good. Thank you. I've and, been looking uh, for region free player just yesterday myself, because yeah. like you said, then it doesn't matter. You just go for, because sometimes we do get um, gypped just because of, of rights issues, you know? Um, by being stuck in a particular uh, zone. So uh, go region free players. I'm assuming Stephanie has a region free player. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Though it did take me longer than it should have in a way. I put it off uh, as a protection. (laughs) Like I already spend plenty on Blu-rays. I don't need Mm -hmm. to open up (laughs) the entire world to it. Uh, But that's fair. Okay. So far. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I haven't gotten too crazy yet, but I do recommend it uh, for anyone out there. It, it's worth having to put a few Blu-rays off for a little while to go ahead and get the player. Yeah, see, I just I just suffered. I suffered not in silence because I talked about it while we didn't <laughs> get Hammer movies in the U.S. I just suffered. And um, now, now, like I said, thankfully, we're getting we're getting most of them from Scream Factory. I don't think there's that many gaps anymore. So, yeah, for um, sure. Yeah, oh, we're catching up. But yeah, yeah, Steph, I'll move it back to you. What's your final uh, Christopher Lee pick? Well, Scott did the capital H hero, so I will do the capital S super villain mm-hmm. with 1983's <laughs> The Return of Captain Invincible. I originally saw this, I think it was 2013 at the Alamo Draft House. I had never heard of it. And I was blown away. So it's a superhero movie. It's from Australia. And it stars Alan Arkin, who plays Mm. a Superman uh, kind of character. Um, But he gets pulled into the McCarthy hearings and he gets... Uh, you know, questioned and he, he's kind of like, you know, I don't I don't need to deal with this. And he just leaves. The film catches up to him a couple decades later, and he's a complete drunk living in Australia. Um, but uh, back when he was a superhero, he had his super villain played by Christopher Lee and um, Mr. Midnight. Yes, Mr. Midnight perfect name and so it's time for them to rekindle that fight and this is such a deeply goofy movie (laughs) which is uh you know why i love it uh like dr goldfoot he uh, a lot of his hijinks he did remotely he was like in his cool lair causing havoc and mr midnight does that a lot here as well like uh, controlling vacuum cleaners to attack people. Um, oh, and and did I mention this is a musical <laughs> mm-hmm. um, done by uh, some of the Richards, I think, from Rocky Horror Picture Show. And you can tell 
Christopher Lee, he gets two songs. Um, one is just encouraging someone to drink, which is wonderful. Um, Name your poison. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad you know this movie so well. It's just you haven't lived until you've seen Alan Arkin in spandex fighting a room full of Hoover vacuums that Christopher Lee is controlling to try to kill him. <laughs> it, it It's a wacky, goofy movie. Um, but if you're a fan of, you know... Australian movies, if you're a fan of 80s comedies, if you like yourself an offbeat musical, this has everything. Christopher and Chris Furley is having the time of his life. Yeah, the, and yeah, directed by Philippe Mora, who uh, uh, did some of the Howlings and he did the, the, uh, Beast, Within. the Beast Within, which is one of my favorites. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's a weird uh, it's a weird movie. It's one of those movies where when it first comes on, you're like, how did this get financed? Um, but that's kind of the miracle of it because it's so weird and goofy. Uh, Lee's terrific in it as the, uh, he, he seems to be having the time of his life in, in a musical and, uh, he really vamps it up. Um, there's one song in particular that I love. Well, name that poison is really good where he's trying to get, uh, Alan Arkin off the wagon, but it's, uh, uh, one that Alan Arkin sings, the good guys and the bad guys. Uh, and he just sings the shit out of it. And it's just a genuinely good uh, uh, musical in a classical sense, a musical um, number. But yeah, uh, if you want to see uh, Christopher Lee just letting loose and uh, and having some fun, man, this is a this is a great choice. Thank you. I thought it was a great choice, too. <laughs> So, Scott, I'm going to turn it over to you for your last Christopher Lee pick. I would be remiss if I, if I didn't pick um, The Wicker Man. This was uh, Christopher Lee's uh, favorite performance. Again, it's just it's a very unique uh, movie. It's it's uh, folk horror. There would be no Midsummer uh, without uh, The Wicker Man. There would be no um, Nicolas Cage with a. a a bee cage around his head, um, screaming, um, you know, it's great folk horror. And again, there's musical numbers in it. And Christopher Lee plays uh, Lord summer Isle who presides over this Island off the coast of, uh, Scotland and, uh, captain Howie, um, played by, um, Edward Woodward, uh, is searching the Island for a missing girl. um, High Jinks and Sue musical numbers. Uh, Christopher Lee is, it is, I think, his most unique performance. Uh, not only in the way he looks with, with the shocked hair, um, but the way he acts too, because you just, you can't get a uh, quite a, a read on Lord Summer Isle, I don't think, uh, until the film progresses and I think that's done on purpose and I think it's done masterfully uh, by Lee so uh, like I said uh, for anyone who hasn't seen this movie um, it's a trip it's, I think it's one of the greatest horror movies of all time certainly of the 70s and I think I, w I might agree with Lee that I think it is his best performance for me this is one of those movies that helped help shape my love of horror because there were the movies that, like I said, what I was talking about is like comfort food. And there were the movies that as I got older and started looking for new types of horror movies, this is one of the ones that really grabbed me. This is the one, you know, where I'm really like they're they're He's like Robin Hardy is like playing a different game than most people. Like, you know, when you're, when you're a kid, there's not really, for most people, there's not the idea of this is a studio pick. This is indie. They're breaking the rules here. But, you know, when, um, you know, when I watched this, like I said, like this kind of opened up a whole new world for me in terms of what to expect from horror, what to expect and appreciate from British horror, that folk horror was even really a genre I should start to seek out and like. Um, this was a game changer in so many ways to so many people, but especially, um, like I said, for me, this, this is, um, this is one of my favorite horror movies of all time. 
It really is a genre touchstone film. I remember I saw it because it was just so widely talked about. And I remember getting the Anchor Bay Wooden Box Edition. Oh, my. I was, <laughs> I was just so excited to finally see it. And, oh, it, yeah, it's just interesting. And there's just something about an entire island of people gaslighting you. And you know they are. And they know that you know. But still going on, just something about that really gets under my skin. Um, and it, yeah, it's just such a unique, wonderful, creepy, beautiful, ugly film. It just... <laughs> yeah. It's always for me, been it's hard the, for me to describe it, but I love yeah. it. For me, I think my favorite thing about the movie is is the inevitability of it. Mm. Um, it's doomed from the get go, and you know where it's going to go, sorta, kinda, but not really. You just know things are not going to end well, um, and had that sense permeates through um, the entire film. I, you know, I grew up in the seventies. So a lot of the first horrors that I were seeing were, they were downers. Um, they just were. So I, I've always, again, it comes down to, I always have a comfort food for this very particular kind of nihilistic beauty, you know? For me, it was like, they can't do that. Are they allowed to, can, can they end like that? Can, 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 can... Uh, <laughs> yeah it's it's such a great great movie um okay well i'm sad because we just have one more pick i feel like we could we could keep talking forever and that means we'll probably have to do a part two um mm -hmm. but um i will close things out um on uh christopher lee with my pick which is curse of the crimson altar or curse of the crimson cult I think this is probably a lesser seen um, film from a few of the people that star in it. Cause it's got Christopher Lee. It's got Boris Karloff. It's got Barbara Steele. Um, and so I don't think this movie comes up as the, um, th th this comes up as, as the, the movie to watch for any of these actors. And I understand the reason why. Um, but again, if you want to keep an eye out for it, Kino has it. They usually have a pretty good deal on it cause it's not in high demand, uh, but there mm -hmm. is a lot to enjoy about this. Like I always said, I'm a sucker for a mystery. You have this antique dealer um, who is looking for his missing brother. And similarly, you know they're, they're playing with him throughout. Um, it's very trippy and psychedelic. It's, you know, we, we definitely see that there is, there are, there are killings, there are rituals going on. We don't know how it all ties in till the end. And I think that um, Christopher Lee... Um, has a lot of fun with this. And, and so does Boris Karloff. It seems like, like I said, whether they enjoyed their own time or they enjoyed the materials, probably their own time <laughs> together. Um, like I said, this one was pretty good. And, and they do say that this is uh, originally based on Dreams in the Witch House by Lovecraft. Uh, it's very loosely based. So I'll say that ahead of time for anyone who hasn't seen it. Well, again, I'll get out of the way. I have not seen this one. So goes on the list and we'll hear from Steph. Yeah, it this one it has such a gorgeous horror pedigree attached to it. I uh, I've seen it once. I did see it for the first time on the Kino Blu-ray, and you know I hate to say it, um, it's okay to me. I don't really have strong feelings one way or the other. I do I do think it's gorgeous and it's absolutely worth seeing just to see the combination of actors work together. Yeah, I, I kind of hate saying, like, it's okay, but that's kind of how I, I feel about wow, it. Wow, way to end. That's a good way to end it. You know what, though? It's okay <laughs> when it comes to, it comes to Christopher Lee. Is too. It's okay. Yeah, it's, I'm fine with it's okay. I knew what I picked. When I was thinking about how this was going to play out, Scott's talking about the Wicker Man. I'm like, damn, I should have just, I should have ended on the Wicker Man. I should have just said Crimson Cults second to last. But here we are. And you know why? Because I don't want to leave on the highest note possible. So everyone's like, hey, we need more. Um, <laughs> That's very helpful. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we are going to end this episode of Corpse Club. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for joining us. Um, for our listeners, where can they find you online? Um, the best place would be Twitter. I'm Scrawfish there. And my blog is linked there, and that has everything on it. 
Okay, perfect. Well, hopefully uh, for our listeners, um, like I said, if you haven't seen any of these, pick them up. Um, we mentioned a lot of the uh, the uh, companies that have put them out on Blu-ray. If you have seen them and it's been a little bit, hopefully, hopefully you rewatch them and find something new to like. Uh, we want to thank Brian, our engineer, for helping us out each and every episode. And as always, we want to thank our listeners, including those who have signed up for a Corpse Club membership. Don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Every rating and review really helps. And you can also find us on Google Play, SoundCloud, and all of your favorite podcast providers. If you want to get in touch, you can reach out anytime at contact at corpseclub.com. On Twitter, we're at Daily Dead News, and we're at Corpse, at Corpse Club. And on Instagram and Facebook, we're under Corpse Club as well. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, stay scary. Stay scary.